Thanks so much for having me here. Um, you know, yesterday I was having a late night hamburger with Andrew and, and Brian Sivak, and I asked them an honest question. I said, uh, is anyone in civic technology talking about the blockchain? Maybe I'm not part of that conversation. Maybe I'm just kind of missing something. But as someone who's been working on civic technology for the last three and a half years, I just naturally kind of saw something that was really exciting. And it seemed a lot like me that this could be the future of open data. And Andrew's response to me was interesting. He said, you know, you got you to help demystify it. Uh, it seems kind of crazy. It seems kind of weird. Um, you know, first you got to have some virtual wallet. Then you get some digital monopoly money. Then you've got to have some PGP, private key, public key kind of thing. And then you got to go find a merchant that accepts Bitcoin. And then the transaction gets validated 10 minutes later by some game of mining that some Chinese miner will validate. And everyone just gets really confused, and they can't get past that. So maybe you can kind of take a moment to explain to them why you left a great job at the White House, started working in a different city like Boston, and dedicate you know, the next few years of your life to working on Bitcoin and the blockchain. And what gets me really excited about it is thinking about how this could become, replace a, an authentication protocol that we've been using for more than 5,000 years. So for the last 5,000 years, we've been dependent on stamps. Uh, in Japan, it's called a hanko. In China, it's called a chop. Um, in some countries, it's made of wood. Other countries, it's made of rubber. Some countries, it's made of stone. Yet everywhere, it's as powerful as your signature. But it's just a stamp. With it, you can buy and sell a home. You can marry or divorce your spouse. You can open or close a bank account. Yet every day, identities are stolen. Credit cards are fraudulently opened up. Homes are uh, illegally transferred. It, all because we have a global dependence on an ink-based stamp. But because of the blockchain, I feel like we're on the forefront of the, the opportunity to actually eliminate what I affectionately call the RSAP, or the Rubber Stamp Authentication Protocol. <laughs> and what I think would, could happen, with your help, is we could actually start um, Open Data 2.0. So Ian Kalin has described Open Data 2.0 as a two-way conversation. Uh, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, but however, uh, until the blockchain came out, which is an open protocol for establishing trust, I don't think it was actually quite possible until today. So to unleash the, uh, the power of, um, of, uh, of the blockchain and, and make it Open Data 2.0, what I wanted to do was uh, take this talk to look at, at a city, state, federal, and foreign level of how you guys could use the blockchain when you go back to work. Um, but because the blockchain's been around for about six years when Bitcoin was started, and open data has been around for uh, many decades, I want to take a minute to try <laughs> and explain blockchain. Uh, Alex Howard warned me not to do this, but uh, let's go for it. <laughs> so I'll start with an analogy that many of us here are familiar with, and it's TCP IP. So the internet is based off of TCP IP, and then on top of it, we started creating protocols. So we created SMTP to send email. We created FTP to upload and download files. And then we created HTTP so we could do web browsing. And this isn't dissimilar to the blockchain. Um, and with the blockchain, this, the best way to think about it is it's the transfer of value or assets and the ownership of those assets. So you, know, you could transfer money uh, with 15,000. It's just debits and credits. It's just a public ledger. Right? But you can transfer ownership of a home, of concert tickets, you name it, any asset can be transferred on the blockchain. And so if we think about it, we kind of have similar protocols being built out. The biggest misnomer is that Bitcoin is just money transfer. That's kind of like saying the internet was built just to send emails. It's actually a lot more because they're building out all of these other protocols. 
So of course you have money transfer, but you also have identity, so you can authenticate your identity to the blockchain. You have reputation, so you can authenticate your reputation, and you have marketplaces. And if you look at this, that's actually pretty similar to what the eBay stack is. Right? The eBay stack is just made up of money transfer, identity, reputation, and marketplace. However, it's not interoperable. Um, same thing for uh, Airbnb and other types of marketplaces, Uber, et cetera. So let's talk about identity for a second. Um, we have analog identities and we have digital identities. So I can log into any application, my Facebook account, my Twitter account, et cetera. Um, but I can't walk into a bank with my Facebook account and say, I want to open up a bank account today. Right? I have to show them my analog identity, which is my passport or my driver's license or something like that. And what can happen is if, you, if states, for example, start authenticating birth certificates, et cetera, to the blockchain, uh, the birthers could live in peace knowing that our president wasn't born in Kenya. And what will happen is, like the internet, which exponentially increased the amount of messages and communication that we have around the world between 2.9 billion people, this will increase the amount of transactions in a similar scale, which can change a lot of things. So what we did is we started the MIT Digital Currency Initiative uh, about six weeks ago. And there's three main areas that we're going to focus on. Uh, one is foundational research. It is new, so we need to look at the security applications, the stability, the scalability, the monetary, and the economic implications. Uh, we're also looking at social impact, and this is where you become involved. We want to work with civic technologists like yourselves, foreign, state, city, federal governments as well, uh, to, to incubate some of this technology because it's so new. And then also, uh, we have an inclusion problem <laughs> with, with Bitcoin, uh, just like we have in the tech community. And if this is going to have as much uh, impact as we think, we need to make sure that the people who are architecting this protocol and these applications uh, represent the, the diversity of America and the world. So let's start with uh, identity theft. So physical theft, as it, this is kind of a stat that surprised me, physical theft, $14 billion in annual losses for Americans, while, where identity theft is $24 billion, which is just kind of mind-blowing to me because the amount of resources we put to protect our physical assets seem to be much greater than identity theft. And as I realized uh, yesterday reading the Washington Post, my social security number and all my other data from working in the federal government are now in the hands of the Chinese. <laughs> so I uh, will look at my credit reports a little more closely. So if we think about the federal level, you know, many of you have kind of experienced that cringing moment when you're on the phone with your bank or, and they say, well, what's your social security number or your last four digits? It's crazy that this is both a username, it's a password, um, and it's just completely insecure. And because we're so dependent on social security number, that's actually what uh, causes in part all of the identity theft that's happening. But what if the federal government could... Um, could authenticate your social security number so that no one had to ask for it. And it was just authenticated to the blockchain. At the state level, you have your driver's license. Uh, so, you know, a recent example of, you know, my friend went to the DMV and she moved from one side of town to another, so she needed a new parking permit. And they said, okay, well, um, your driver's license no longer works because we issued it three months before. Real ID came out from DHS, so we're not going to accept the driver's license we issued you to prove who you are. And then they started saying, well, and how do you prove that you moved from one side of the other, town to the other, so we need you, you, your utility bill, your pay stub, and all these things to prove that. And these things are all forgeable. They're things that we can produce in Photoshop in 10 minutes. Yet, this is what the state government is using to authenticate that you went from one place to another, whereas if you were able to authenticate this to the blockchain, you could do it digitally do it online and get out of the DMV's line. Uh, there's also an opportunity for regulation at the city level. So one of the big challenges that many sharing economy companies have today is, while they probably regulate in real time better than city governments for many of the services that they're providing, 
Uh, the challenge is figuring out that's it's not their responsibility to do to ensure safety for the citizens, it's the government. And so one opportunity is to use the blockchain, use the reputation protocol, for example, to be able to um, share that information with the government, and that could enable algorithmic regulation, which Tim O'Reilly calls the, uh, the bugaboo of today's politics. Every time I read that line, I think of Tim O'Reilly and Beyonce. Uh, <laughs> Hernando, this is a funny image. Uh, <laughs> Hernando de Soto, um, who is the famed Peruvian economist, uh, has been talking about this as well. So he's well into his 70s, he's not a technologist, and um, he, uh, we, were, we were together last week and he said, Brian, I've been working on the chain my whole life. And so his whole theory is, if you're able to give uh, the poor in Peru and other developing nations property title, they're able to leverage that up like Americans do to start their small businesses and they have you know, uh, billions of dollars in assets that go untapped because they don't have property title. And so he pulled out the blockchain, or he called it the chain, where um, he showed uh, 40 pages of different property titles of the history of one piece of land in Peru. And how, if we were to push this um, into countries like Peru, uh, there are opportunities to, uh, for, to put property title and actually let people kind of let, let, the develop, let people in the developing world lever up and, and access the capital that's allowed for capitalism to, to, to do so well in America. Um, and if you think this is all crazy talk, uh, according to a Reuters report, Honduras is already working on using blockchain for a property title. And so although this technology has been around for six years, you can imagine that the developing countries that have crises are going to use this technology like they used cell phones, and we're just going to give you leapfrog. That's why I encourage you guys to start getting, working on this technology. But, you know, we're battling against a, a 5,000 year old culture. If there's one thing I learned in government with technology, is that it's not the technology that gets in the way, it's the culture. And we're battling a, a pretty big culture, and so we're going to need your help working on this. And so I encourage you to just send me a tweet at Brian Ford or um, just find me around here and grab my business card because uh, we're really excited to help incubate your ideas and work with your city, state, and federal governments or your nonprofits uh, to implement this. And together we can achieve Open Data 2.0. Thanks so much.